paper bag, that slows the moisture loss as well. So those are the kinds of, of options you've got. You dry it, uh, you know, generally speaking, they say a year. It really depends on a lot of, of variables. It could be as short as six months, and it could be longer than a year, depending on the species, when the wood was cut, you know, the time of year, uh, how dry the atmosphere is around it. All those things affect that. So, um, you know, and again, we could spend a couple of hours just talking about all the specifics of that, and that's not what this demo is about. But it does lead into why do you use dry wood for platters? And platters generally are, you know, fairly large, and the thing that's coming around is about a foot. You know, very simply, I could have done a bigger platter, but as a demo piece, all that means is there's a lot more time just getting the wood turned away, and so that's why we're doing something about 12 inches in diameter. But a piece of wood, even 12 inches across, if it was green, you turn it, and what's it going to do when it dries? It's going to warp. It's going to turn up on the edges across grain. We generally don't want our platters to rock around on the tabletop. That's not the idea of a platter. So that's why platters are generally turned out of dry wood. Generally speaking, it's not usually much more than a couple of inches thick. So, you know, you can dry that fairly reasonably. And then you begin with the dry wood. You turn the piece, and it's going to stay pretty true. That doesn't mean it's not going to move at all, but it, you know, especially you get into 16, 18 inch diameter pieces, uh, depending on the species, there's going to be an eighth of an inch of movement in that bowl just seasonally living in Ohio. If you live in Utah, it doesn't change much. It just stays dry all the time. And wood stays really stable. So, uh, and one interesting thing, I've got to throw this one in, mesquite. Anybody ever turn mesquite? Okay, a few of you have. Mesquite's the only wood I know of that does not shrink across grain any more than it does with the grain. It simply does not. So you can turn a green bowl and it doesn't warp. It's, it's amazing stuff from that standpoint. Uh, so it, it, it becomes real interesting. Uh, I have never gotten a two-inch piece in green and just turned it to a platter. But I have a feeling it would be very stable. So it might be the exception to the rule. And it's gorgeous stuff besides. So if you can get some, if you're going to Texas, you know, take a trailer and bring a bunch back for all of us. Uh, but, you know, so mesquite has that, that one characteristic that I don't know of any other wood. Do you know any, Joe? Anything other? It's the only one I know of that's like that. So very unusual. Okay, so we're starting with, with dry wood, and because of that, it means that we can surface the stuff. It's going to be flat. Um, it also allows us to do some other things. Now, those of you that turn platters, how do you start out? How do you hold the piece? Come on, a couple of people. What's that? Face plate, Okay. Okay, so you're going to put a faceplate on, screw it on, and turn the back side. Okay. Anybody else? Anything different? Screw chuck. Okay. What's that? Tape. tape. Yep. This is not green, so you can use double face tape, which really is going to use a faceplate as well. I mean, you got to have something to put <laughs> the double face tape on. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, all of those options are good options. And none, none of them are right and none of them are wrong. Okay. But because it's dry wood, it gives you all those options. With wet wood, three or four of those options go right out the door. The double face tape doesn't work well on wet wood. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to use a, a screw on this, the screw chuck. Not the greatest in wet wood. I mean, they'll hold, but the wood's softer, and some woods it'll just pull out if you get very aggressive at all with your turning. Okay? Uh, because this is dry and flat, 
the screw chuck works. Turn it using a Forstner bit and putting a recess in works. Okay, again in Greenwood, I'm not going to say it won't work, but it's certainly not as good. And it's not going to hold it as accurately, without a doubt, for a lot of reasons. It's not going to cut as cleanly, the wood is softer, you got a lot of stuff going on. So because we've got dry wood, it opens up some of those options for us. Okay? Again, any of them are, are fine. Uh, actually, a faceplate's a great idea. I don't do it because I'm lazy. With the screw chuck, I can drill one hole. If I put the faceplate on, you really almost have to pre-drill the holes in most woods because the screws are going to want to start to split and do that kind of stuff. In green wood, you can just put a faceplate on and put the screws in. It's not going to go anywhere. They may not hold as well either. But So any of those options are, are available to you. Okay? So that's kind of cool. Um, so what I'm going to do, since I've got this thing on there, is get the chuck and the screw and get this thing put on the lathe. Um, and I could have, you know, put the the screw in this beforehand, but I actually wanted to do it now. Um, when you put this in, on this particular one, there are flats on there that you line up with the jaws. And what I like to do is get it in there so it can't turn. And I'm actually going to pull it forward and then tighten it up. If you don't do that, when you bottom the blank on there, it may not be bottomed. You'll pull it up and it'll come up to the face of these jaws, but then if you keep trying to turn it, it'll turn some more because what it's doing is pulling that screw center forward until the shoulders on it hit inside the jaw. If you don't do that, the first time you start to turn with the tool, it'll tighten up. And that'll make it slip and can cause some weird things to happen. Hopefully nothing bad. But So, get this started on there now. Um, this blank, I'm doing something weird with it. It has some rough wood left on each side. When it was plain, it didn't get it all the way down. So you would think you'd make that the bottom because you're going to turn that away anyway. But this blank has some weird spots on it. It's mold from where it was laying against another piece. And it doesn't go real deep, and so I'm making that the bottom because I'll turn it away, rather than if I didn't, on the, it could be on the rim of the bowl, and, or the platter, and I just didn't want it on there. So that's what's going on with that. Uh, the size of your chuck can also, uh, you know, be of some concern. If you go look at chucks, they say that the talon is only recommended for lays up to 16-inch swing. And Cooper sitting back there nice and quiet this morning. That's very unusual for him. He just came to my house a couple of weeks ago and did a little bowl because his lathe wouldn't swing the 18 and a half inch thing that we turned. And I don't own a stronghold. So we weren't able to do his bowl, I guess, because I didn't have a big enough chuck. Uh, that stuff, I don't really get it. You can put larger jaws on this. That body is all you need to hold whatever you want to hold on a wood lathe. I just don't find the need for the stronghold. It's not that I don't like it. It's just bigger than I think you need, and it adds a ton of weight and just adds to that flywheel effect every time you turn it off once it coasts a lot longer. So, you know, and again, that's just a personal thing. There's nothing wrong with the stronghold. I just don't own one. So we managed to get his bowl done with, without one. So. Okay? All right, so... First thing I'm going to do is just get this thing round. Um, you're going to find that I'm going to bring the tailstock up, and the tailstock is going to be on there as long as it can be. Do I need it? Not really. The screw center will hold, but with this in there, it makes it almost impossible to pull it out of that screw. And if I want to get aggressive, I can get aggressive. So 
so I can remove wood in a hurry if I choose to. You know, for a demo, you tend not to get too wild and crazy, but when I'm home alone, I want to get stuff done, I get after it, and having that there lets me do that quicker. So um, that's really the only reason for it. Okay, um, we can talk about the tool, the grind, all that stuff if you want to. It's a bowl gouge. It has just a plain old grind on it, and hopefully it's sharp. Beyond that, I don't really much care. Uh, if you want to talk about the angles on the end, we can talk about that. Again, I don't really much care. Uh, you know, that the whole thing about measuring the angle and having little jigs to put on the sharpening systems and all that. When I started turning, there were no sharpening systems. You went up to the grinder, and I thought I was cheating, really. I used to put a rest that I would set to help hold the tool and then rotate it around. The guy that I learned from, Rudy Asolnik, had a wheel on a washing machine motor. There was no tool rest, there were no guards, there was nothing, and he would just walk up and go like this and go turn. And so, you know, that's how I learned to do it. Um, it can be somewhat frustrating when you're <laughs> beginning to turn. Uh, and you don't necessarily come back to the piece with the same angles all the time. So you just learn to not worry about it very much. You just get the tool up there, get the bevel on, and start turning. So, again, I'm just going to try to get this round. I'm going to come up to that edge and stop. Why did I do that? If I turn out off the top edge, it's going to break those fibers off, make it all fuzzy, and I hope for that to be the <laughs> rim of our platter, so try to keep it clean. Okay, we'll look and see. I think we're pretty close to round here. All right, now, what's, what's the next thing I should do? Go back here and start turning this? Or you don't care? Or <laughs> Get the top true. Before you start turning the back side, you've got to know where the top is. And right now, I already showed you that this has got some spaces here and on the opposite side that haven't gotten true and flat yet. Okay? I need to do that. Otherwise, if I'm turning this, your eye doesn't catch that that's not a true rim up there. It just sees wherever the top is is, is that top shadow. And on something the size of a platter, that's not real critical, but you get a bowl blank, and if you don't get that top established first, you're going to get a shape that looks great, and you stop the lathe, and if you rotate it, one side doesn't look so good sometimes because it's lower, and, and you got to reshape everything and kind of start over. So I'm just going to come in, just take a little bit of the cut off of here, Sounds like it's true. We'll see. And I just, I've got it there and here. Just got to true. So I'm there. I don't need to take any more. I'm just going to go back, come out to that. So visually now, when I stand here and look at it, I am seeing one continuous line, not a thing that's moving in and out. That will help you more than you'll ever believe if you do that first. It, your shapes will just be a little better and all that. Okay? So now I'm turning the lathe off so that it's always obviously not running when I'm moving the tool rest. Okay? And I'm going to just start to get rid of some wood now. Not too worried about shape or anything just yet. So I'm just going to come around here. And I actually have a smock that I would normally put on, but the air conditioning is uh, on the warm side today, <laughs> so I'm just not bothering to put the thing on. I'm already sticky enough. So, uh, but you know,
Now I want to leave enough up here for a rim. It's still a little heavier than I want it. That's the next thing I'm trying to do. So all I was doing was getting rid of that wood on the corner so I can come up and get the rim thickness next. Then we'll worry about making a shape that comes up to that. Okay, that's about what I want, probably about a quarter of an inch. It doesn't really matter, you know, I'm not going to measure any of this stuff at all. Now, to me, the other thing that, that comes in next with platters is that normally th for a bowl, that would just be a shape. It comes right up and that's your bowl. But here, I want a rim. We'll get to why and all that in a little bit. You don't have to. Platters do not have to have rims. It can just, you know, just be like a bowl, but when it has that kind of shape, people tend to call them shallow bowls. Uh, you know, platters, I always think of them as it's almost like you've turned a bowl that has a picture frame around the outside. And they're just pleasing, you know, and what I really like about it is that you leave some of the natural wood even when you use it, you, you know, put a salad in the thing or, you know, more likely you put out maybe hors d'oeuvres in a platter or chips, who knows, you know, you use it how you want to use it. But the point is, the inside can be covered and full of whatever you want in there and you still have wood. And that's pleasing. I like that. It's obvious that it's a wooden piece. You know, a bowl, you fill it up, you do a salad bowl and put salad in it, you don't see much wood, a little bit on the top. Of course, you get the, the outside. With a platter, you don't get to see much of the outside because they're so shallow. When it's sitting on the table, you don't really see much of that. So that's, for me, why a nice rim is, is a good thing. Okay? All right. So now I've got that, so I'm going to continue to turn some and just keep taking more to get back so that that rim is defined on the back side. Then we'll worry about the base and all that other stuff. Okay, now, a couple of things. I never even talked about speed, and i got to look. I'm at like 700 on this piece. It's getting a little slow now because I'm turning down in here. The piece is pretty well balanced. I can bring the speed up some. All that's going to do is let me move the tool faster. It's not going to cut better or anything else. I can just remove wood a little more quickly. But there is certainly a top end where you don't want to go, okay, and... and where that is, there is the little magic formula. You take the RPM times the diameter, that number should fall between 6 and 9,000. Okay? That represents absolutely nothing. It's not, you know, RPM, it's not surface feet per minute or anything like that. It's just a number. So this is 12 inches in diameter. I want to be somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000. So, you know, if I did 1,000 RPMs, 12 inch diameter, where does that put me? 12,000. That's too fast. Okay? So, really, this bowl, even at 800 RPMs, you're getting out there. Now, it is a good solid piece of wood. It doesn't have voids in it. It doesn't have anything. Is it going to fly apart? Probably not. Do you want to be standing next to it if it does? That's the question you always want to ask yourself. Uh, you know, doing demos a lot of times, you know, where it's a turning class and the people are beginners. I mean, I've taught classes, swear to you, 
that I've had people walk up to the wrong side of the lake and try to figure out how they're going to turn. You know, I mean, the tool rest is on the other side, everything, and they still walk to the opposite side and are like, okay, what do I do next? So, uh, and, and, you know, I'm saying all that because I always tell those classes, the wood lathe is one of the safest machines. In, in a wood shop. Uh, and just for the fun facts, the number one machine in the wood shop with the most incidents, most cuts, bandsaw. They're not necessarily serious ones, but an awful lot of thumbs get nicked as people are coming around, you know, and all that. It's a stitch or two. Table saw generally are the ugly ones you know, because they remove pieces uh, because it happens so quickly. But the wood lathe is relatively safe, except for the one fact. It has the highest death rate because large pieces come apart or come off, strike people in the head, and it kills them. Now, luckily, it's not hundreds of thousands of people a year, but it can happen, and that's why speed is so important. You don't want that thing coming out of there. And if it does come out, if you notice, the whole time I'm turning this, I'm never standing in line. And most of what I'm doing right now, you know, I'm turning this, and, you know, it's, it's not the most comfortable. It would be much better to come back this way, but we can talk about why I'm not doing that. Uh, but when you do go this way, then you're in line with the piece, too. And... You don't really need to be, and you can see I'm getting a few shavings, but most of them, the way I'm turning, they're going past me. They're not coming at me. Okay? Uh, question? Well, outboard's not going to change that much. I mean, if it's outboard, I could still stand in line with it and turn. Well... Because you, there's what outboard gives you. It's not awkward. And nothing wrong with outboard. The only thing with outboard is having the tailstock support. Not that you can't, but it becomes a little more problematic. One way makes a setup that you can put a tailstock out there. Um, you know, if you've got that. But then that not awkward part becomes you're still working around the tailstock. So, you know, there's advantages, no doubt about it. I, I think with most of these demos, how many of you even can turn outboard on your leg? You know, how many of you can't? There you go. So, if you've got it, use it. <laughs> if you don't, you can still do it, okay? All right, let's go back to this. Why am I not turning this way from the outside going in toward the bottom? No support of the grain. No of the grain. Now, you, you said it well. Okay? If I'm going this way, particularly on the end grain where it's running through here, where that comes out, I would be running into those end grain fibers and they're not supported by the fiber under them. And what's going to happen, instead of a reasonably clean cut, I'm going to get a lot of tear out. Now, on the long side, it'll do just fine. But twice in every revolution, it's not going to do so well. So whether it's awkward or not, for the sake of the wood, coming from the bottom up is the best way to turn it. Okay? Now, when I'm doing this, I'm starting to get a little bit of hop with the tool in here. Of course, it's not going to do much now because I said it, but when that starts to happen, when it begins down here, it's really hard for me to get the bevel on the wood. That's why you'll get some of that. There's other things we can do, which I'll deal with in a minute. Right now, I don't really care that I'm not getting a perfect cut, but I can get around like this, and I can get pretty good bevel contact.
Now, do you hear a little bit of chatter? As I get further out on this piece, I'm just getting that because the wood flexes a little bit. Now, there's a couple of things I can do. Again, right now I'm still shaping, but I'm just about getting where I want with the rim. So I'm going to clean that up. What I can do is drop the handle down and get bevel like this and cut that and get pretty good contact. I can also do this cut like this where I control the cut by coming around on the side of the tool. With this particular tool rest, I want you to look, the tool, if you can see, is actually hitting down here on the rest. And that's why I'm having a little trouble controlling it because it's as though I'm turning three or four inches off the tool rest. Um, I have this tool rest at home, only I modified it so it works better. And what I've done is put a round rod on top of it that I've brazed to the top. And so when I get down like that, the tool is still resting like it was on my finger. I can stay close to the work and get away with those cuts a little easier. So what I'm going to do now is fix all that craziness that's up there. Okay, so I've got a reasonable cut there. Now, there's my rim. Now I can start to do some stuff with the bottom. Okay, decide where it's going to be. How big do you turn the diameter of the bottom of a platter? Okay, a third I heard. Why? Okay. I tend to agree with you. Okay, bowls, absolutely a third is great because a bowl basically is curved up and you can load it full of stuff and even on a smaller base it will sit very nicely. And my argument always is look at Tupperware. It's about as utilitarian as you get and if you look at the bases on them they're, they're almost exactly a third the diameter of the top. So you know it works. With a platter because it's flat if you put apples in there, it's going to tend to rock around. So you tend to make the bases a little bigger. And about half is pretty good. On this piece, that would be about six inches. Um, quite honestly, I'm not going to measure it, but I'm probably going to go a little under a half, but I'm going to make the base about right there for this piece. I'm just doing that visually. That's where I'm going to put it. Okay. Now this brings up something. How am I going to hold this to turn the inside? I'm going to turn a little wood. Think about it. We'll come back to that. On this particular cut, this is where I would use that high angle cut if I was at home on my lathe. Okay? It's a nice shear, you ride on this side bevel, control it by rolling the handle. I can't really do it with this tool rest and all that, so what I'm really doing now is a shear scrape. And that leaves a reasonable surface and it certainly gets rid of a lot of the tool marks, the ridges left from the tool. I'm just moving those out of the way so that as I come around I don't bump anything with the handle of the tool. And I'm just trying to get a reasonable curve around there. Okay, let's come back to the question. How am I going to hold this when I turn it around? What's that? Recess, okay. If I made the base a third the size of the top, what effect would that have on the recess? Anything? What's that? Smaller. Smaller. Absolutely. If I take this base and I move it in and make it about a third, and then I put a recess in there that I'm going to expand the jaws into, 
I've taken away a great deal of the mass around this. And when you expand those jaws, it's trying to separate the wood. And if you've done a smaller base, then you could start to get in trouble there. Okay? It's why I never use that on larger bowls because I want a smaller foot and I never do a recess on those because then you're expanding and you don't have a lot of support around it and you can break them off. And that's not a good thing to have happen. That's a big block of wood that <laughs> decides to leave the lathe. Okay? Um, got just a couple of little things here. There's a little thing right there that I can see. I'm just going to clean this up just a little bit. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time messing around trying to get this thing absolutely perfect. The good news is I'm also not going to sand. Makes a lot of dust. It's boring to watch. And this is walnut. And a lot of you may be somewhat allergic to walnut dust. It does make me sneeze a little bit. That's about all it does. And turning is not too bad. It's when the sanding starts that it gets bad. But I'm not going to do that. Okay, so now we've gotten all this stuff. I am going to turn just a little bit across here. This, this is pretty flat and smooth, but it does have that staining. I don't know if it's probably not showing up on the camera, but some of you can see the little spots on there. There you go. So I'm going to turn a little bit and see if I can't get rid of most of that. And then we'll worry about putting a recess in and all that. So I'm going to break that rule now. I'm going to come across this way. And I'm doing that to try to just get a nice sharp edge off that base. I'm going to look and see if we... Well, that one's going fairly deep. I'm not going to get rid of it, so that's life. But now I can actually come around here, turn the tool, and just go in like this. And what I'm doing is basically turning across that flat grain, and the wood just sort of peels off. It's pretty easy to do. Now, I also turned it so that that rim is not perfectly flat. If I lay the tool across, it does go in. It doesn't go in by a lot. It just turns in just ever so slightly. So it's going to sit pretty much on this outside edge. If you leave a big wide thing down there, sometimes they can rock a little bit. So you put just that slight taper. You never have to worry about it. It's going to sit on the outside and be fine. So now it's time to put the recess in. Um, and so I need to get some dividers and measure how wide the jaws are and put a line on here and do all that. right? so that you get it the right diameter, so that the jaws fit well and all that. Okay, I just did that. And I know you all saw it. Now the truth is, I'm doing this right now, and now I'm going to get rid of the tailstock because it's in the way for what I'm going to do there. And I will push that back so that hopefully I don't hit that point too many times while I'm doing this stuff. Now, get the rest around there, and we'll put the recess in. Here's what I was doing. I know that these centers are an inch and a half in diameter. I know that the jaws want to be somewhere around two and a half, two and five eighths. I guessed. I went out about a half an inch beyond that. Inch and a half plus a half on each side makes it two and a half. That's all I was doing. Is there anything wrong with using dividers and measuring or putting a pencil mark? Not at all. But again, that old man, Asolnik, never measured anything. He did all kinds of stuff like that. He would know the centers. He used the old delta centers. They were like so. They tapered down. They had another step and another. He knew what every one of those were. You could just ask, how big is that? Five-eighths. That's three-quarter. That one's an inch and a half out there. He knew all those sizes, and he would just gauge. You know, he did candle holders that were real, slight, beautiful pieces. And all of those, the different diameters on them were all things off of the machine. He never measured any of that stuff. Yet they matched all the time. So, you know, 
it's just little things that you, it's another tool you don't have to pick up or do. Now, if you need a break, <laughs> you can stop the lathe and measure it and, you know, change the pace a little. Um, he was all about production. And when I say that, he literally estimated that it, over his lifetime he turned about 250,000 candlesticks. That was just the candlesticks that he did. So, you know, and he sold them in sets of three and all that stuff. Uh, you know, but he, he was a production turner. He wasn't messing around. When uh, it was funny, we'd go to his house and he'd start turning something. He'd say, you're not demo in front of a group. Get it done. And it was a whole different pace than when he was demoing for, for a group. There is some nasty grain down here. You can hear it on this tool. Usually you do this and it just peels right off. But right here on the outside of this, I just want to get that recess deep enough to be sure that the jaws have a good hold. Now one thing you can do too, if you want to play with this, you can leave the center of this raised a bit. It's still below the surface of the foot and all that. And you can, you know, play around and come back and turn some little beads or on the bottom or do some other things in the center of there if you choose to. Um, I'll put a little something on this just to play with it and then we'll move on. What's that? Yeah, that's what it is. And, and generally, on this, you're peeling off that face grain and it just peels right off. This has just got, like I say, a little bit of wild stuff going on in this grain down here, so it's not cutting as cleanly as it usually does. I, the only reason I use it, I like it because I get a real square shoulder here. That's what I'm after. Once I've got that, I don't really care. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go to a gouge now to do a little something in there. So that's, uh, this one's sharpened like a diamond. It's, it's, so I don't use it as a bedan at all. So, yeah. It's just a wide parting tool. <laughs> but because it's square, you can lay it square on the rest. It doesn't rock at all and go straight in and get a nice square shoulder. Oh, yeah, no, no. No, don't, don't take that. I wasn't using it as a bedan at all. It's just, yeah. On your smaller pieces, what determines whether it's a or a What you call it. <laughs> that would be craftsman prerogative. <laughs> uh, honestly, I don't know where, where one sort of leaves the other. If it's, if it's 16 inch diameter, it would kind of make you a glutton if you called that a plate. Uh, but. Yeah, right. I was just going to say, 12, it's a little bit big for a plate, but, it, you know, it could work. And probably 10 inches and down, it's a plate. So it's that sort of 11 to 13 inch range that, you know. Oh, I don't much care. I, Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of that stuff, I just don't think it's worth worrying about. It, you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is a definite buffet plate here. You know? there, there you go. I got it. Perfect definition. <laughs> Depends on where you're eating. Okay. Um, I'm just going to play around here a little bit just to put something in, but... The reason I'm really doing this is I want you to see what I'm using for a tool. And it's just a little spindle gouge. Now, this spindle gouge has a fairly blunt angle on it, which makes it convenient for doing what I'm doing here. 
It also is what I use to hollow boxes and goblets and end grain stuff. Again, the blunt angle helps you to get inside and do that. So the tool works for that. Uh, a lot of people would use like a 3 8 bowl gouge here. I think I have one somewhere. Uh, I just don't use 3 8 bowl gouges much. I also don't use 3 quarter inch bowl gouges. I use that whatever you call it, half inch 5 8 <laughs> You know, Is it the flute or is it the diameter of the steel? But that's what I use. That's what I turn bowls with. And if I need to do little details like this, I just grab the spindle gouge. I've already got it. It works great. I'm not trying to remove a bunch of wood. And I'm not working way off the tool rest, so none of that really matters. That's what I use. So I just want you to see that, you know, and, and know that you don't really have to necessarily go out and buy a new tool to do something. And you might get someone here who says, you know, as the demonstrator, that. 3 8 bowl gouge is the only way to do this. Well, for them it is. For me, I just use this. And again, it's not right or wrong. It's just a difference, and that's okay. Now, I'm just trying to clean this up. Uh, obviously, we want to do as little sanding on this kind of stuff as we can. So you try to get it cut fairly cleanly in there. Okay? I can live with it. It's not perfect, but we're not going to mess with it much more. Okay? That's it. The outside is there. Now, under normal circumstances, it's dry. It's not going to move. I don't have to worry about anything. I would now sand this stuff. from Starting from the recess out, I still wouldn't do anything in there. When I expand into that recess, it may or may not leave marks. I'm going to put this on a vacuum chuck or something, turn it around, and make sure that there's nothing in there. I'm going to clean that up. So I'm not going to even try to sand. If you try to sand, what's going to happen to that nice sharp edge? It's going to get rounded over. The jaws may not hold as well, all that stuff. So I'm just not going to fool with it. I can sand this, I can sand this, and I can put finish on it. But I'm not going to do that. The truth is, I generally don't even put any finish on the outside at this point. Because I'm going to turn it back around and do the base. I'll do the whole bottom when I do it. I've got to get the finish out again to finish the inside anyway, so I just do it all at once there. The inside I would sand and finish on the machine before I you know, get at least a coat on it before I flip it around. Okay? All right. Your base right now from your recess is fairly wide, which I understand. Right. Right. Um, yeah, some. You know, because what I'm really going to do is come in this way and get rid of that sharp edge. I, you know, I'm going to relieve that. And... I play with them. You know, sometimes I'll put a little bead inside there if I've got one over here. Sometimes I don't. But it's going to get somewhat narrower. I'm not going to leave it that wide. But how much? It depends on the day and the mood and all that. Yep. Oh, it might be an eighth. It doesn't need to be a lot, really. Uh, looking at it, I may go just a touch deeper, just... It's a demo. I don't want things to go wrong. Make sure it's got plenty, but really an eighth is enough. It, you know, it doesn't need to be real deep. I predominantly hate dovetail chucks. Really? <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm going to grab this guy. Um, here's the deal. A dovetail chuck, in theory, holds really well because you've formed a dovetail for the jaw to either open into or if you're doing a, a spigot to grab. I teach a lot of beginning wood turning. I, I don't know enough to teach advanced stuff, so I just stick with the beginners. It, really, I love teaching beginning stuff. And so, here I'll, is this better if I move over here, drive you crazy with the camera? Getting the dovetails right are the trick. 
And a lot of folks will grind a little tool that has a dovetail on it, and they just hook it in or under the, if it's a uh, tenon. You get it right, those dovetails close around that, it's great. Try to teach a beginner to get that right. So what happens is their, their jaw makes contact either at the very bottom or worse, at the very top of that dovetail if it's on a tenon. And it, as soon as you put a little pressure on it, it pops it right off because it crushes those fibers. If it makes full contact, they're great and they work well. But because I teach so many beginners, to do just a straight tenon is not too difficult to teach. And these things have these recesses in there and they grab it. On the outside, you've got a couple of recesses, or I mean uh, lines that, that dig into the wood, which is why when I expand in there, I'm probably going to mark it, but I come back and turn that away. I just, uh, it's just easier. Part of it is it's what I use all the time, and so I'm just not a big fan of the dovetails. Doesn't mean they're wrong. They work. There's no doubt about it, but if you don't get a good fit, they don't always work. So, you know, and I've said that in front of groups and, you know, had everything but rotten tomatoes thrown at me for <laughs> saying, what do you mean? You know, they, they love dovetail jaws. Well, sure they do because they use them all the time and they know how to fit it. Yes, sir? Yes, exactly. If they don't, again, I could draw some things, but, you know, if they don't, if this is my piece of wood and I bring the jaw in and that dovetail is too shallow, we'll put it that way, then the bottom of the dovetail isn't going to contact and just up here at this edge is what's going to contact. When I tighten it, it's crushing those fibers because it's just hitting a, a fairly sharp edge. It doesn't hold very well. And as soon as you put pressure, it starts to slip. And once it starts to wobble, you know what happens. It wobbles its way right out. Yes, sir? Exactly, and and that's what I said. A lot of people have a tool, you just go in with it and it works, and that does, and that solves the problem, and you're you're set. Yeah, and and again, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're doing that and you're getting it right, do they hold? They hold like crazy. So, you know, again, I I'm coming from that thing of teaching classes and making it as simple for people as I can. But if you have that tool, uh, when I go to John Campbell Folk School, all their chucks are dovetail jaws. And when I get there, I go to their drawer full of tools, go to the grinder, and I grind a dovetail tool. I put it on the bench and tell everyone, there's the tool. When you get ready to do your tenon, use that tool. And that eliminates our problem. But, I, you know, so that, that's where it's coming from. So I don't generally do dovetail recesses. Okay? All right, I'm going to get this thing turned around, and it sounds to me like this is a perfect time for the break. So, okay?